but I think the prerequisite to a miracle is that you don't have to be perfect, you have to be willing. Baba, Sai Baba does not heal everyone. You know, there are people that come to the ashram that are, you know, are crippled and blind and he knows what medicine they need and sometimes the medicine they need is to learn to deal with whatever medical problem he has. People have come with cancer and with a wave of his hand he's healed it. Sometimes he gives them the booty. Sometimes he says, go have surgery and sometimes he lets them die. And sometimes. So you cannot understand why the miracles happen, but when you've been around him a while, you know that they happen constantly, and when they're not happening, you have to search your heart and find out what's gone wrong. And Sai Baba says, whatever path you're on is your path to God, be on it. He doesn't care if you're Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, Jewish. Sai Baba's teachings are very simple, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, and your neighbor as yourself. And those were the same teachings as Lord Jesus. If Lord Jesus works for you, love Lord Jesus with all your heart. When you've got that, you've got Sai Baba inside you, whether you know his name and form. For those of us who've been lucky enough to come and be in the divine presence, very few of us have doubts. I mean, when he took the letter, he looked at me right in the eyes and he smiled so sweetly and our fingers touched, and he was electric. And he went to the end of our section, and he turned to go up towards the inner temple, towards the Mandir, and when he turned the corner, I had this thought, did he just take all of my karma? And as soon as I had the thought, an ocean of light poured in through the top of my head, and the tears came, and this energy ran for about 14 hours as he watched me from the inside out. What does an ocean of light feel like? Ah, it is equivalent to it. It was the most wonderful golden white light that came in through the top of my head and just filled my entire body, and it just kept running. It wasn't your imagination. It wasn't my imagination. You weren't dreaming. I wasn't dreaming. Longtime follower of Holy Man Sri Sancha Sai Baba, Kelly Killian. Kelly is from Arkansas in the United States, but he would be the first to tell you that today his home is in Prashanti Nilayam. Welcome to Soul Journeys. This interview was recorded inside Baba's ashram, Prashanti Nilayam, India, in January of 2004. Thanks for agreeing to sit here for this. Uh, what brought you to Baba? Well, um, I started hearing about Sai Baba in about 1980. It was the year after I got out of law school, and I had some friends who knew about him, and they told me that there was a holy man in India that could just wave his hand and materialize any object, and he gave rings and necklaces and diamonds and presents to his devotees. And the first time I ever heard about him, I had this thought, one day I'll go see him. And every time thereafter, when I heard about Sai Baba, I had the same thought, you know, someday I'll go see him. So it, that just stayed in the back of my mind. Um, in 1988, I had a massage teacher by the name of Sarah Stewart in California who told uh, her story on a videotape, which I watched. And on the videotape, she described how um, she was unhappily married to a lawyer and living in Sonoma and a woman she barely knew came up to her and said, I have an apartment at an ashram that belongs to an Indian holy man named Sathya Sai Baba and I have a round trip ticket which is not refundable but it's transferable and she said we have a family emergency and I can't use the ticket and I got in my meditation it's for you if you want to go. So Sarah thought about it for three days and said yes and she came to the ashram and she described on the video how she used to sit uh, day after day on front row and Baba would come to her and uh, she watched the Indian women reach down and touch his feet or the hem of his robe and then they'd go into a swoon or begin to cry and she was just too proper, too uptight to do that so she never touched his feet even though he'd stand in front of her day after day after day. And one night as her trip was almost over she was back in her apartment here at the ashram in India, and she had this thought that he operates outside of time and space. So she 
said she bowed down as she was falling asleep. She kissed his feet, and she asked in him, her mind. In her mind, yeah. She just uh, imagined this, and she asked him to heal her karma, and she fell asleep. And she said that night she had a dream, and in the dream um, he started showing her a movie with a wave of his hand on the wall of the apartment. And then she said, I realized I wasn't dreaming, I was awake, and he was standing in the room, but I could see through him. But the movie was still going, and the name of the movie was called Healing the Healer, starring Sarah Stewart and Sai Baba. <laughs> and he showed her her life's work. And she said, but the movie kept going faster and faster. And she asked him to slow it down, and he laughed, and he said, no, that'll be revealed to you later. Well, Sarah went on to become one of California's great shamans, a great healer, and all of her workshops are called Healing the Healer, starring Sarah Stewart and Sai Baba. Uh, and a couple weeks after watching her video, I was in my apartment in San Francisco on a Sunday night, and as I was falling asleep, I called upon Sai Baba, I bowed down, I kissed his feet, I asked him to heal my karma, and I fell asleep. And that night I had a dream. And in the dream, what I thought was a Brazilian medicine man, because he had this big hairdo, and I just assumed Sai Baba had long white hair You'd and never a stringy seen beard. I, I had no idea what he looked like, but every guru I had ever seen a picture of had long white hair and a stringy beard. Stood by my bed, and he touched me with two fingers, and he opened my six and seven chakras, and he filled me with so much light, I woke up, and I, it was like, <laughs> like that. I was just completely surprised, and... He was standing by my bed, and then he was gone. And for the next five days, I was just floating. I, just, I didn't know what had happened to me. It was something really wonderful, and I was just filled with light. And about two, day, two weeks later, I was in a metaphysical bookstore in San Francisco, and I saw a book called Man of Miracles, uh, Sathya Sai Baba. And I pulled the book out, and there was a picture of Sai Baba on the back. And when I saw this picture, I just <laughs> absolutely just, I freaked. This was like, oh, you know, of course that's who it was. That's who I prayed to. And I've always told people that Baba came to me in 1988 and stole my heart. But I didn't come to see Sai Baba until 1997. And I've asked you this before and I'll ask you again, why? Why did I come? Why did you not come sooner to him? Well, I was, um, I was uh, working in a huge law firm in California, and... You were a lawyer? I was a lawyer in those days. I also had been studying for years all sorts of metaphysical things. I had become an ordained minister. I spent five years training as a clairvoyant. I studied with Lazarus, a channel consciousness, for ten years. Any particular denomination of being a minister? Uh, it was non-denominational Christian, right? that's okay. the best way to, to put it. It was a healing ministry. Uh -huh. um, and I eventually formed my own church up in Portland, Oregon, and just did healing services, but had no doctrine mm -hmm. um, whatsoever. I, I just tried to meet people on whatever path they were on. Um, but in 19... 90, I began working on what was the largest lawsuit in the United States. It was called The Case from Hell in the Eighth Circuit. And by 1993, I was over the edge. And we'd been working just unbelievable hours. How many hours a week? Um, about 16 hours a day, usually seven days a week. You mentioned it's, earlier to me before we started of your chronic fatigue syndrome. Yes. Maybe it might have had its origins in 16-hour work days. Yes, it, in 35 cups of coffee a day. Uh, uh, yeah, I was, I was pushing the envelope. And I, not only was I working like two full-time jobs at a law firm, I also had a small uh, clientele that I did healing work. And I used to be on a radio show in San Francisco called Alchemical Radio. And I had a little C healing center in, in Napa that I um, used with a friend of mine from um, Napa, and I did workshops, and I took four days a month, and I studied with Lazarus. So I was about the busiest man I've ever met, um, and I could survive very well on three or four hours of sleep every night until 1994, when I just broke like a stick, mm -hmm. and I found out I had Epstein-Barr. 
I quit my job at the law firm and I thought if I just took a couple weeks off and maybe traveled and took a vacation in Bali or something for a month, I'd be all right. And I went to Portland, Oregon and spent two years in bed at a friend's house and I was still sick. Um, and I've had this roller coaster of chronic fatigue for the last nine years. Um, recently I've realized that Baba is all names and all forms and one of the forms he took with me was chronic fatigue and he used that as a way to transform my life. I was on the wrong path, I wanted to do healing work and yet I kept going back to law because I like the money. So things that appear to be bad can in fact be good and can in fact be divine like anything else. Yes, yes. I so chronic fatigue was Baba. Chronic fatigue was Baba. Um, I didn't recognize that for a long time. In 1997, over Memorial Weekend, I went to a weekend retreat at an uh, ashram in Southern California by Anand, Anandi Mahadevi. Devi. Um, a Caucasian guru and at the end of the workshop she sent for me and she took me into her garden and she held my hands and she looked me in the eye and she welcomed me and she said you know you're always welcome here this is your home she said but we're not your guru she said Sai Baba is your guru your next step is to go to India and see Sai Baba he holds your heart in his hands she said you're being stripped to the bone everything is being taken from you your health your wealth, your home, your image, your career, everything that your ego knows is you, is dying because you've been praying a prayer of purification and that you want to be a great healer. She said, this is the Shiva dance. She said, do not try to go back to law. Do not try starting a healing center yet. You need a stronger spiritual foundation before you begin. So I spent the summer trying to go back to law or start a healing center and I just didn't have the energy and I couldn't manifest anything. And by August, I was down to my last $18 on earth, um, having no place to live. And this was a big fall. At one point, I'd been living in a penthouse on Telegraph Hill in San Francisco and living La Vie en Rose. And suddenly, everything was just in shambles. My life just felt like it was completely ruined. And I was in tremendous pain, just a tremendous emotional pain. I just, you know, I'd been a magnet for success for decades and suddenly you know I was almost completely homeless mm -hmm. and I began writing Baba and mailing letters every day saying you know I have chronic fatigue I'm in pain bring me home and by 1997 that fall in August when I finally realized I had $18 left, <laughs> I realized I have nothing and no place to go. And when you have nothing and no place to go, go to God. And I charged a ticket. Yeah. And I came to India. Um, and I s prayed to Sai Baba. I said, you know, I don't even know how to find you. Send me someone that can show me the way. And lo and behold, I was connected with a woman by the name of Pat Garland, who was coming for her 21st trip. She was a longtime devotee. And we met, we liked each other, and we traveled together. And so I had a companion that made it a little easier uh, to get here. And from the point where I decided to come, it was just all this magic happened. By the time I stepped on the plane, I had about $350 in my pocket, so I wasn't completely broke getting here. Um, but I was ill. Um, one of the big leelas that happened on the first trip was uh, we had a layover in Singapore um, for two and a half hours and we arrived at midnight. Getting off the plane, she met a young Indian man who was living in Sacramento, California, uh, who was on our flight and he had just finished writing a book on Advaita, the philosophy of, of non-dualism. And he was a Sai Baba devotee and he was en route to Bangalore for a, a family reunion or a wedding. She had just finished writing a book on Advaita, so we invited him to breakfast and we found a restaurant open on a mezzanine in the lavish Singapore airport and as we were going up the escalator I noticed the music and the music was a hymn and it was my favorite hymn from childhood and I thought this is very strange but it was an orchestral version yeah. 
we went up and we had a leisurely breakfast and had a nice conversation with this chap. And then we went back down the escalators again and started going through the duty-free shops. And I started asking, do you guys know this song? No, they didn't know the song. Well, at 1 a.m., the tramways between the terminals at the airport stopped running, but they have a skyway system. So we had to change terminals. And so we hauled our carry-on baggage through about three terminals. And everywhere we went, this music was playing, and it was the same song. And we finally get to our destination, and I asked them for the umpteenth time if they knew the song. And she said, well, you keep asking us about the song. What is it? And I said, well, it's really weird. I said, the song's been playing since we got here. <laughs> and she said, well, what's the song? And I said, well, it was my favorite hymn growing up. And she says, well, what's it called? I said, it's called Softly and Tenderly. She goes, well, what are the words? And I said, well, I don't remember all the words, but it goes, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. And then the rest of the stance, I can't remember. I said, but the refrain goes, come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home, come home. And she put her arm around me and she said, don't you get it? She said, this is a Leela. This is the divine play from Sai Baba to you, Kelly. It's two in the morning in Singapore. She said, we're in China. There's no one in this whole airport that knows this song but you. And there's no version of this song that plays for two and a half hours. And figure out where you're going. And she said, and, she said, and remember, you're the one that was writing Sai Baba letters every day saying, I have chronic fatigue. Bring me home. You're the one who's weary. He's bringing you home. And I got on the plane, and we flew to Madras, and I wept the entire way. I mean, just bhakti tears, tears of devotion. I couldn't wait to get to see Sai Baba. We changed flights. We arrived in Bangalore as the sun was coming up, and originally we planned to spend a day there and rest. And she says, what's your sense? Do you want to spend a day here and rest up or do you want to push on and go to the ashram? I said, Pat, I got a message on this flight. If we get there this afternoon, I will get an interview. She said, well, then let's go. So we hurried to the ashram and I was checked in and I was given a room, but my roommates had locked the door and had gone to Bangalore for the day. <laughs> and a man from Spain rescued me and he took me up to his room and he said, quick, change your clothes. Baba's you know, about to start darshan. I'll take you to darshan. So I put on my ashram lights and we ran to the temple and we sat clear in the back. And Darshan was just beginning and when Baba came out, I had one thought when I saw him and it was just, I love my beautiful God. And it just kept coming. And I wasn't sure if he was putting it in my head or I was thinking it. <laughs> I was just ecstatic and he walked through the temple and the whole thing was over in 10 minutes. And you were way in the back, and he I, was up front, and, and he never I, came close to you. He never came close to me, and then he went up on the veranda, and all of a sudden all the Indians and the people in the back started standing up, and then people started pushing me and saying, go, go, and go what? And they said, go to your interview. And I said, he didn't talk to me. I'm clear in the back. And then people kept saying, go, go, and I finally left the temple. And I found out the next day, he had indeed called the Americans wearing the American oh. scarf, and I had the American scarf on. It was August, it was still hot, so there were only 13 Americans with their scarves on, and I was number 13, the unlucky number. I was the only one that didn't go to oh, India. Oh, no! <coughs> Before I went to India, I was at the Los Angeles Center, and a young man named Leslie um, told his story and when he was 20 he had chronic fatigue and he came with a hundred dollars in his pocket to the ashram and he actually stayed for five years and Leslie had on a watch a bracelet a big gold bracelet a chain with an own all symbol all made by Baba all made by Baba but on his wedding ring finger he had a diamond ring and the diamond was the size of an Indian rupee it was the <laughs> biggest diamond I have ever seen and it was round cut and it sat up you know almost a half inch. It was just outrageous. And Baba had materialized that and said, this is a diamond. And indeed it was. And after Leslie talked, um, he, I asked him, I said, well, how much is this ring worth? He said, well, I've never had it appraised, but someone told me it was worth at least $400,000. <laughs> I said, well, do you always wear it? And he says, 
Yes, he says. I said, well, you feel safe? He said, well, I feel safe for two reasons. One, while I'm worried that I know Bob is protecting me. And two, he says, no one believes this is real. <laughs> um, so after missing my first chance to have my interview, I was really crazy for a few days and just begging, Baba, Baba, please call me for another interview, and I want to ring, Baba, please, I want a beautiful diamond ring. Like and one more space. time, what year is this? This is 1997. So on my third day at the ashram, in the morning, I'm sitting on the second row, and I'm sitting there, and once again I'm praying, oh, Baba, call me for an interview, and give me a beautiful diamond ring like Leslie's. And I was into that thought for about 10 minutes when I got thumped on the head, and it was like, I didn't come to India to get a ring. And I took out pen and paper, which I had the paper in the back of a book, and I wrote Baba a letter. And the letter said, Beloved Swami, please transform me into a beautiful diamond. Fill my work with love. Fill my new home with love. Fill every cell of my body with love. Take all of my sins and all of my karma from all of my lifetimes. I love you. And I signed it, Prima Sai Baba, Prima 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 Kelly. <laughs> prima means divine love. And I put it in an envelope and I address it to my beautiful God. Well, Darshan sh started maybe 20 minutes later and Baba zigzags through the temple as he comes. And there were two aisles of, or two sections of men facing each other across an aisle that was maybe 15 feet wide. And when Baba came through, he went to the men directly across from me and he did something, and I couldn't see what he did. Maybe he materialized the booty, but his back was towards me. But he stopped and he stayed there for a long time, like you know, probably 90 seconds, which is a long time for Baba to stop. And all the men on my side dropped their letters except for me. I just held mine up. And suddenly Baba's head came up, he spun around very quickly, and he started walking directly at me, but he didn't look at me. His eyes were scanning all the men on my section. And he came right to me and he stopped and he reached forward and he took the letter out of my hands. And when he took the letter, he looked at me right in the eyes and he smiled so sweetly and our fingers touched and he was electric. And I was like, you know, it was like, whoa. And I was surprised. And he turned around very quickly and he went right back to what he was doing. And I'm just, I'm dumbfounded at this point. What just happened? And then he, a few, maybe 30 seconds later, he started back up and he went to the end of our section and he turned to go up towards the inner temple, towards the Mandir. And when he turned the corner, I had this thought, did he just take all of my karma? And as soon as I had the thought, an ocean of light poured in through the top of my head and the tears came and this energy ran for about 14 hours as he watched me from the inside out. What does an ocean of light feel like? <sighs> I've never done heroin, but I would think it is equivalent <laughs> to it. It was the most wonderful golden white light that came in through the top of my head and just filled my entire body, and it just kept running. It wasn't your imagination. It wasn't my imagination. You weren't dreaming. I wasn't dreaming. So... I was like, what just happened here? Um, very puzzled, but I was still sick. Baba continued to take my letters every day. On day seven, um, I got a front row seat. And as we were sitting down and the men rush in to get the best seats, there was a young kid, maybe 20 years old to my left and an old man to my right. And as we were sitting down, this young boy said, oh, I hope he comes close enough that we can touch his feet today. And I just said, maybe mother will feed us today, because Sai means mother and Baba means father. And I thought, well, maybe Baba will make us the booty. Well, when Baba came walking out, he made a zigzag, and suddenly he started walking right towards me, and he stopped in front of me, and his hands started going like this, and our hands went up to receive it, because we knew what he was doing. And the booty began to flow, and first he fed the old man to my right, which is correct etiquette, then he fed the young boy to my left, and then he filled my hand with boo booty. <laughs> and I ate just a little bit of it. And I took and I saved the rest in a piece of paper. And I folded it all up very carefully, and after Darshan, 
I went to the village and I bought a little pill box. But when he filled my hand with it, and again when I ate it, this energy just filled me up. I mean, I was just in complete bliss. I've never had an experience all right, like that. Um, I have since, but I mean, I was just filled with just light and joy and love. Who needs an interview after all that? I do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Baba, if you're listening, I could still use the interview. Um, and that morning passed, and I gave just little tastes of this babuti to my roommates and maybe one American that I knew, and I saved the bulk of it. In the afternoon, when we were queuing up to go into the temple for afternoon darshan, I saw a man carrying his son, and his son looked like he was 10 years old, and the son was obviously very, very sick, just skin and bones, but the boy was very beautiful. And it's like, oh, Baba, please heal this boy. He's so sick. And they disappeared, and I didn't see them again until after I was in the temple. And in the afternoon, I got a front row seat, almost in the same spot where I'd been sitting in the morning. And then I saw this man come in, maybe 20 minutes later, carrying this boy, and they sat eight rows behind me. And I thought, well, I should maybe change seats with him since I sat on the front row this morning and then I kept thinking, no, everything that happens here is by Baba's will. He says so, so obviously I'm supposed to be on the front row and they're supposed to be back there. And He sees everything anyway and I didn't really worry about him, but every now and then I'd look at him. Well, when Baba came out for afternoon darshan, the men stood up behind me and they were trying to give him letters and it dawned on me, this man had this boy in his lap and he probably couldn't even see Baba when this happened. And Baba went by and it just kind of broke my heart. It was like, oh, Baba didn't even see him. And Baba went up on the veranda and he did an interview, so he disappeared after a few minutes. And when Baba <coughs> gives an interview, it's a signal that people that would like to leave early can get up and depart. And so a lot of the men were standing up and I turned around and this man was picking his very sick son up and I just got up and I ran over and I had this pill box and I <coughs> took it out and I said, Baba's Vilbuti. I said, Baba made me this Vilbuti this morning. And Indians began to translate for him and the father nodded. I took the top off and I just poured it into the boy's head. And after I did that, I laid my right hand on his forehead, which I don't know what possessed me to do it, but I'm a healer. And when I laid my hand on his forehead, a lightning bolt went through the top of my head, down my arm, into this boy, and the boy went <gasps> like that and just passed out. Were you scared? And I was stunned. <coughs> um, I'd done some amazing healing work before, but I mean, this time, I realized that the energy that comes through me is Satya Sai Baba, and I never really was sure what it was all about. And then the Seva dolls were moving everybody out, and, and there was all this confusion, and they left, and I left, and I never saw them again. And I never knew what happened, but I, um, after deep reflection, I thought it was another little divine play by Sai Baba, and I'd been praying for him to bless my healing work, and he let me have a little taste of, you know, being of service, and I think whatever happened, um, he allowed to happen through me, and I just assumed that the boy was healed of whatever was wrong with him, um, and I hope that's true. That's and a great it, story. It was, it was wonderful. Uh, what do you make of people who are your friends, relatives, and neighbors who uh, think perhaps you've gone over the deep edge with this guy called Sai Baba? How do you explain to them, how do you begin to explain to them where you are on your spiritual path? Well, I find you can't explain to them, and eventually you just leave them on the path. They're where they're at, usually very stuck. I have tried to share my teachings with many of my friends, many of my family members, uh, if they're completely close to it. Um, you know, I don't push it. It's like it's not my duty to teach anybody about Sai Baba. It's his duty to enlighten them. Um, and, but I think 
what my friends and family have noticed is how much I've changed. I went from being rather angry and arrogant to being very soft and gentle and kind. Um, What's I've happened been, to the anger and resentment? I gave it to Baba. Um, and occasionally, you know, I get a little taste of it, but it's, you know, it's, it's not part of my day-to-day -day reality. I guess um, I don't have to ask you how Sai Baba has t transformed your life. Um, it's like the old Kelly died. You know, what was is no more. Um, I don't know that anyone mourned for it except for me while I was going through it. But I really am a different person. And it's like I was on the wrong path. Um, greed and lust and <laughs> the usual um, toxins and poisons that we have were doing me in. And I knew I wanted to be a healer, to be of service. It's what made me happy. And I realized that by the age of 40. But I was making so much money at the time, I just held on to what I was doing too long. And now I'm age 52, and I feel like the nine years of chronic fatigue, that cycle has come to an end now. And I'm being reborn into something. I don't know exactly what it is. I know that my purpose is to teach, to heal, to communicate. Um, what do you think you're going to do with the rest of your life? Well, I'm probably going to spend a great deal of my life living here in India. Um, I believe that Sai Baba is divine. Um, I have no question that he is God. By the end of my first trip, he had shown me that he was omnipotent. Um, he made me vibhuti. I watched him make rings and stuff. He showed me music for you at midnight yes. in Singapore. He was omniscient. He could answer every one of my prayers. I tested him many times. And he Sounds just like was right omnipresent there. with that one and he was omnipresent in my apartment in San Francisco. And you know, when I finally realized what I had just said, you know, that that's the definition of God, I surrendered. Um, and I just don't have doubts about Sai Baba anymore. I sometimes have a little confusion, um, you know, when you see this man, you know, do things that you can't possibly see, wave his hand and there's a, you know, a necklace this big or, you know, makes somebody a ring or heals somebody or, you know, comes to me in a dream or, you know, makes my life wonderful. It's like, I, I go into confusion at times, but it's never the doubting kind. It's just like, it's just, it's more than I can get in this little tiny brain of mine. Mm -hmm. So let's take a second and try to make sense of this. Uh, let's pretend your mother's watching this, or your next door neighbor, or somebody who's on a spiritual path, but they've yet to even hear Baba's name. And they're highly intrigued by what they've heard so far from what, from what Kelly has said. A and yet, they're waiting for the next piece of the puzzle. What else can you say to them? that might be of use, whether they're going to pursue Sai Baba or not. How else has Sai Baba, I guess I'm looking for, um, wrestled you to the ground in such a way that you know your life has changed permanently, even though you still have these periods of confusion? Mm. I would... Um, and if this I would, isn't I would, a I would passing, just, fleeing... Yeah, I would say that... Um, I don't have an answer. Um, I think that many people, this is not their first step. This Sai is not Baba, a fleeting moment for you. This, this is, is not a fleeting moment for me. Sai Baba says whatever path you're on is your path to God, be on it. He doesn't care if you're Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, Jewish, you know, whatever form of God you pray to, whoever it is, you know, that moves your heart, that's what you should do. Sai Baba's teachings are very simple, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. And those were the same teachings as Lord Jesus. If Lord Jesus works for you, love Lord Jesus with all your heart and do your service. It's love all, serve all. When you've got that, you've got Sai Baba inside you, whether you know his name and form. So knowing Sai Baba is, is, not, um, is not crucial. It's whatever, wherever there is love, there is Sai Baba. 
and I think he is uh, the embodiment of love, the perfect form of love. Um, for those of us who have been lucky enough to come and be in the divine presence, very few of us have doubts. As but you've never to, given you an interview. Um, he's given me dreams, he's given me messages, he takes my letters, he um, has answered all my prayers, he has changed my life. Um, and yes, someday he will talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. Um, he's just filled my life with joy. I don't know how else to describe it. Let's um, conclude this, if we can, with uh, a, a, a quick version, if it's possible, and take the time you want, of the story you told me in the uh, temple about the uh, young boy whose mother wasn't quite sure how to deal with his problem of HIV, which progressed worse. Oh, yes. Um, after my first trip to India, a woman by the name of Petrita Martinez from uh, California spoke at the Hollywood Sai Baba Center and she told the story of her son Bobby. And Bobby at the age of 20 had uh, been diagnosed with HIV and Bobby never did anything about um, the HIV. He didn't take any of the drugs and at the age of 25 he got sick, went to the doctor and the doctor, after doing a series of tests, told him that he needed to prepare himself to die. He had two to four months to live, that his viral load was in the millions, and that his T-cell count was two, and it should be around 800, and that there was nothing they could do for him. He had late term AIDS. And Bobby's mother, being a Sai Baba devotee, gave Bobby vibhuti, which is this ash that Sai Baba materializes and uses as medicine. And Bobby told me, I interviewed him five times, <clears throat> told me that he began to put a pinch of it in a glass of water morning and evening, and he would drink it, and he spent the days in bed listening to New Age music and hymns and budgeons. She was a devotee, but he wasn't. He wasn't. And, uh, yeah, he's kind of a party boy. Um, <laughs> and, but he said, I was raised Catholic. I believed in angels. I believed in miracles, and I knew I was going to have a miracle. And he said a couple months later, he was feeling really bad. He went to the doctor and he was put in the examination room. And while he was waiting for the doctor, um, the nurse came in. He said, I didn't even look up. He said, she started taking my pulse with one hand and flipping through my medical records with her other hand. And then she said to me, she said, you know, Bobby, if you keep taking your medicine, you'll be all right. And then he said, then I noticed her hand was darker than mine. He said, I'm Mexican. And I looked up and it was a little Indian nurse. And he said, no, I don't take the AZT or any of that stuff. He said, I watched my friends take it and they all died, so I never took it. I said, oh. And she keeps, she was still holding on to him and she kept reading through his chart and she said it again, Bobby, if you keep taking your medicine, you'll be all right. He said, no, I, I never took any of that stuff. You know, it just, you know, I never, I never tried it. And, uh, she goes, oh, and she kept flipping through the chart, and she said it a third time. And he said, well, you know, I, I don't do that. He said, the only thing I ever took was this booty from Sai Baba. And she turned to him and she goes, oh, you know Sai Baba? He goes, yeah, my mother's a devotee, and she gave me the booty. And she said, yeah, just keep taking your medicine, you'll be all right. Well, then she left, and the doctor came in, and they ran some more blood work. And the following week, uh, he gets a call from the doctor's office, and they told him that the doctor had some serious concerns and he needed to come back in and see the doctor. He said, and I was just completely bummed out by that. He said, I lived in Long Beach and the doctor was in Beverly Hills and it's an hour and a half commute and I wasn't feeling well. He said, and I, but I drove up there and when I got there they put me in the doctor's office and the doctor came in and he had my charts and he said, Bobby, he said, we've got some test results here. We just you know, need to talk to you about, we just don't understand. He said, um, we need to find out what your health routine is. And Bobby laughed and he said, I don't have a health routine. And, you know, the doctor started inquiring about his habits and his diet. And he said, no, I eat junk food. He said, I, you know, smoke cigarettes. I said, I smoke pot. He said, I drink, I drink coffee. He said, I never worked out. He said, you know, I don't have a health regimen. 
And the doctor said, well, are you taking black market drugs from Mexico? Are you taking the AZT or the protease inhibitors, you know, that are coming across the border? And he goes, no. He said, I never took any of that. The doctor says, well, Bobby, he said, your test results show that your T cell count is normal and your viral load is undetectable and there's no antibodies to the virus in your blood. He says, for all intents and purposes, you know, it looks like you've seroconverted and we don't have an explanation. And Bobby said, well, um, your Indian nurse told me if I kept taking this blue booty from Sai Baba, I would be all right. And the doctor goes, what? So Bobby had to explain that Sai Baba was an Indian holy man who's considered an avatar who materializes an ash, which is called vibhuti, which is used as medicine, and that his mother gave him this, and that he was taking it for a couple months. And the doctor listens with his mouth open, and then he leans forward and he says, Bobby, I don't have an Indian nurse. <laughs> and Bobby was completely healed. Now you're a bright man. You know the difference between fiction, folklore, and truth. Yes. And? I think Bobby had a miracle. Um, you know this man. I know this man. Um, and his mother. And his mother. And I spent um, that Christmas at their house and there were so many Sai Baba miracles that happened at Christmas that um, if you have a second I'll share just one. Sure. Um, on Christmas Eve I gave Bobby's mother a little cassette of Sai Baba chanting the Gayatri Mantra uh -huh. that the Italians made and they dubbed it over and over again and set beautiful New Age music in the background. And I gave her a picture of Sai Baba in his Christmas whites. He wears white at the Christmas holidays and his hands were a blessing. And she was just in tears. She loved it. And she said, well, I want to listen to this CD, but I don't have a stereo in the dining room. And she sent her daughter, who was about six years old, up to the bedroom to get a tape recorder. And she came down with this really cheap, maybe $12 tape recorder from like Radio Shack. And they put it on the buffet. And she put the CD in and turned the volume down low. And it played throughout our Christmas Eve dinner. And we had a wonderful time. Well, on Christmas Day, I wasn't invited to that function, but she had even more of her family in. And she told this story the following February at the Hollywood Sai Baba Center. And she said one of her nieces at Christmas started getting upset because she put this cassette of Sai Baba chanting the Gayatri on while she was serving, you know, the Christmas feast. And the niece said, I don't want to hear Sai Baba. It's Christmas. I want to hear Christmas music. And Petrita said, no, no, I love Swami. I want to listen to this. Kelly gave me this. I love it. And she says, well, I don't. It's Christmas and I don't want to listen to it. And she reached over and she hit the stop button and it didn't stop. And she hits the reject button and the volume goes up. And she reaches over and she says, well, I'm not going to listen to it. And she unplugs it. And it continued to play. And she says, well, I'm taking the batteries out. And Petrita said, good luck. And she turns it over. And it's not a machine with batteries. <laughs> and this thing played for 45 minutes. And they couldn't turn it off. And Baba sang 45 minutes of the Gayatri Mantra to him. And oh, that's, that's just how much story. fun he is. He's just always filling and, his devotee's and, lives with little miracles and magic and always reminding you that he's there, that you're loved, and that everything and lastly, is, is, is going to be all right. He can also be a mystery, as he still is to you, because I talked to you earlier, about why he apparently hasn't, although he's taken AIDS away from Bobby, hasn't had much of an impact on Bobby to the degree that his lifestyle doesn't seem to have changed. Well, I lost, I lost track of Bobby in 1998 when um, I moved. Um, so I don't know what's happened to Bobby since. But I think the prerequisite to a miracle is that you don't have to be perfect. You have to be willing. And, um, and have faith. And he, he believed the guardian angels from his old Catholic religion were going to save right. him. Right. And Baba, Sai Baba does not heal everyone. You know, there are people that come to the ashram that are, you know, are crippled and blind and, you know, he sees what's in their heart. He's said it many times in his books and interviews and he knows what medicine they need. And sometimes the medicine they need is to learn to deal with whatever medical problem 
He has. People have come with cancer, and with a wave of his hand, he's healed it. Sometimes he gives them the booty. Sometimes he says, go have surgery, and sometimes he lets them die. And sometimes he says, cancer, cancel. Yes. And so you cannot understand why the miracles happen, but when you've been around him a while, you know that they happen constantly, and when they're not happening, you have to search your heart and find out what's gone wrong. Um, well, this has been a delightful 42 minutes and 31 seconds. Uh, well, thank you. Any note on which you would like to draw this to an end? About anything on any level? Yes, it's just, it's all about love. It's all about love. If you have no interest in Sai Baba, don't worry about it. Find someone in need and help them, and Sai Baba will be there. Uh, it's just, just do your duty. Um, that's all I ask for, which is just to love one another, um, and it will change your life. Wonderful. Thank you. And Sai Ram. Sai Ram. Respecting and abiding by